I've always said about myself that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the jury. That's who I am. And I've gone out, I'm deliberating, and the only problem is I'm never coming back. I'm always going to be in the jury room. I'm never coming back with a verdict, and I'm going to live my life that way. And I believe that I can be an effective member of society living that way. And so far, it seems to have proved to be true. I was in rehearsal with uh, another play, Dirty Story, about Israel and the Palestinians, and I was on a break. I was sitting in the empty audience with uh, one of the actors in the show, and there was a silence fell, and uh, in the middle of the silence I said, I I'm going to write a play called Doubt. And he said, what's it about? And I said, that's all I got. But gradually, I realized that it was going to be about these nuns, this order of nuns, the Sisters of Charity, that I had when I was a boy at St. Anthony's in the Bronx as a kid, and uh, because they had these peculiar bonnets that I hadn't seen shown in any movie or uh, in any play. And I thought, oh, I should do a play about those nuns. I read the newspaper to see what isn't in it, and that's what I want to write about. And that absence, that darkness, that dark spot in the frame, that I thought, well, there's a play there. And then I, but I still didn't think it was, it was, uh, it was, I felt it was too on the nose. And then one day I thought of this black mother and uh, her particular perspective on her child and the child's problems in the school and the suspicion of wrongdoing against this child. And that's when I thought, now I have a play. And that's when I began to write. Sister Aloysius is me. Uh, and Father Flynn is me, and the boy is me, and Sister James is me, and none of them are, you know, because they're all extractions of, you know, one part of my personality going to war with another part. There's a part of each of us that really wants to have certainty, and there's a part of us that pleads against it, that says, you know, life is more complex than a simple yes or no, and you, you, you will never have the full explanation of the motives and even the actions of others. So you must reserve judgment. Well, the great thing about my childhood was that I was raised in an Irish-American household. My father had a brogue. He came to this country when he was 24. He was from County Westmeath, from a little farm. And he had several brothers who also came over, and they were also always over at my house. And I had several aunts who were either first-generation Kellys uh, uh, from Tipperary, or they were Irish. So I was surrounded by Irish people. My father played the accordion and uh, Irish music, and my aunts danced in the living room, and I danced with them as a little boy a lot. Uh, and everybody had to sing a song or tell a story or tell a joke, and that's how we were raised. Now, uh, it's important for a writer to get some kind of distance in order to be able to write. So for me to simply write about that, it was just too close to me. It was, trying to, it was like trying to write about my own eyeball. And, uh, but I grew up in an Irish and Italian neighborhood. And so I turned my Irish sensibility on the Italians and listened to the way that they talked and celebrated them as an Irishman would. Without having an Irishman in the story, an Irishman was just outside the door holding a light on their family. And that's what Moonstruck is. That's me delighting in the Italians because they weren't Irish. They had better food than I did. They had more interesting clothing than I did. They had better hair than I did. They were more open about sex than I was. And I loved all of that. And it opened my heart and my eyes to many things I wouldn't have had otherwise. And it was something that, as an artist, I could really, really get behind. You know, I was this downtown playwright. I was poverty-stricken. I did uh, Danny and the Deep Blue Sea, and I made $5,000 total from the run of the play. So there's no money in it, you know? But I quit my, I had a straight job at the time, the only one I've ever had where I had to wear a shirt and tie. 
And uh, I quit my job and I said, I'm going to be a full-time playwright from now on. And I was 34 years old and I was below the poverty line. And uh, nobody uh, wanted to do my next play, Savage and Limbo, except this one little theater company that just started with some kids just out of college. And they produced it, and it created a certain excitement, but the reviews from the standard reviewers were not good, nor were they for my next play. Uh, but uh, I, at that time, realized that if I didn't do something to change my situation, I'd be back painting people's apartments again. So uh, I, took, uh, I got a national endowment for the arts grant, which was enough for me to live for one year, very modestly. And I set about during that year to change my situation. So I watched a bunch of movies, read a bunch of screenplays, and I, and I wrote uh, two screenplays. And uh, the first one was a movie called Five Corners that uh, was made uh, with Jodie Foster and John Turturro and uh, Tim Robbins. And uh, it was kind of, it turned out pretty good. And George Harrison, the Beatle, put up the money for it. Uh, and uh, then back to back with that, that wrapped, and a week later, Moonstruck went into production. And then that wrapped, and, we, and it opened, and it turned out to be a phenomenon. And uh, the next thing you know, this downtown playwright who's never made a buck in his life is sitting at the Academy Awards uh, waiting for his category, which takes three hours to come up. And then they read my name. And I walked down the aisle. Uh, first, I walked very slowly, and I started walking faster. And I was embraced by uh, Gregory Peck and kissed by Audrey Hepburn and handed this golden statue. And I turned around, and I thought, put down your sword and your shield and let this in. And I realized that I've been fighting all my life and that here was a moment of acceptance and approbation like a golden light, which comes along very rarely, if ever. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who ever punched or kissed me in my life, <laughs> and everybody who I ever punched or kissed. It had been these years of struggle, and these years of you know sudden love and, and pleasure from unexpected directions. That is, you know, the the central affects that people give you, the things that they hand you. They hand you in these moments where they grab you to kiss you or they grab you to throw you off the roof, uh, both of which had happened to me many times in the Bronx. Uh, they, they wake you up and they remind you of who you are and they connect you to the human race. And in that moment, I could finally put my defenses down and admit my pleasure at both extremes. I was very fortunate in that nobody taught me how to write a screenplay because if anybody had, I probably wouldn't have written Moonstruck. I just had the time of my life and wrote as the speeches as long as I wanted and let the people say as much as they wanted. And it turned out that the audience wanted them to go on like that and wanted to hear that kind of uh, real celebration of language that maybe had been absent from film for a while. The great thing about working in theater for as long as I did, and I have, and I do, is that you get the audience in your body. You're there night after night. When you do a play, night after night, you're in this little room with these 50 or 60 people, 100 people, 300 people, and, and as often as eight times a week. And you are experiencing the play with them and through them, and you get them in your body and when you sit down to write a screenplay where there is no audience until it's too late, you can write a line and then you can feel yourself as the audience responding to that line. You are a participant. It's not until the audience shows up that the last character is present for every story that's told. I very often have decided to write plays where I lay out everything I know and the problem that I'm wrestling with in the first five minutes with no idea what comes after that, except that this is a burning question because this is a problem in my life and I'm going to attempt to work out what to do about this problem in my life on stage. And the thing that makes it have high stakes is I make a deal with myself that whatever the solution is, I'm going to do it in real life after the play. And you'd be amazed at how that puts a fire under you to get it right. To find a place in the literature, an Irish place or an Irish-American place that has not been investigated, 
is a formidable challenge for a young writer and maybe too much of a challenge. You know, part of being Irish is to be clever. Uh, and I was a clever young fellow, and there, I had no intention of being taken up by the Irish-American literary mafia because I felt that I would be categorized in a way that would be limiting to me. Probably the, one of the two plays that I admire most in the world is Playboy of the Western World, which I consider to be a masterpiece on every front, a masterpiece of language, of human insight, of plotting, and of structure. Can I, is there some avenue uh, that I could find to top John Millington Singh in that particular area? I think not. I'm going to have to outwit not only him but myself to find a place that I can stand on and call my own. And that's the real estate that I always seek. The fascinating thing that happens sometimes when I'm writing is I come unexpectedly upon structure, upon great structure. And it's a revelation. Uh, Stanley Kubrick said a story that works is a miracle, and he was right. Uh, and so when you're writing your way forward, and suddenly a door opens and you're in this big, beautiful room you didn't know was in the house that you walked into, that structure. And you go, wow, I had no idea this was part of the house that I had just entered, the story that I'm telling. But I am so glad it has this room. Uh, and uh, then if you find like three or four of those rooms, you've probably found something very good. Well, you know, I found out that Facebook is an excellent place to write poetry and to write short thoughts that uh, are provocations uh, for other people to uh, look at life maybe a little bit differently. I like the idea of art for art's sake, and I like the idea of art that is destroyed or is transient. I like the idea of theater in part because either you were there or you weren't. There's a night sometimes where something enters an actor from another dimension and you see something that it's a once in a lifetime come out of that person if you were there. And if you weren't, you missed it and you can hear about it in the folk tradition that surrounds the theater, but you weren't there. Uh, and I like that very much. So I like to put on shows for one night only uh, and then never do them again. I've done, I would say, a dozen of those in my life. Uh, big, you know, 90 minutes, uh, musicians, actors, singers, the works, script, and I script the whole thing and do the whole thing. And uh, that's a very important part of my life. And Facebook and being able to do these status updates where I write things that uh, occurred to me that morning or that afternoon are very stimulating to me. The challenge of saying something that isn't bad at least once a day is, is good for me. Well, the more, the, more, the more you have, the more you don't have to invent, the, the easier it is. <laughs> I, I do write for screen and for stage, and you frequently get asked, which do you prefer? What's the difference between writing plays and movies? And they're just different forms. I'm almost never confused about whether it's something's going to be a play or a movie. If I have an idea, if I'm lucky enough to have an idea, it usually comes to me with the form attached. Um, and I think, oh, that would be a good idea for a play, or that would be a good idea for a movie. I wouldn't refer to Margaret as an art film. I wouldn't refer to any film as an art film. Art film, to me, I usually think it means it doesn't have much of a budget. It'll be judged by a different standard by critics and by distributors alike. And to me, it has no meaning whatsoever. It's a movie is a movie. A bad movie is a bad movie, and a good movie is a good movie. <laughs> this is Our Youth is autobiographical in the sense that it's the life I led at the time and the people that I knew at the time. I'm not in the play myself, but the characters are all composites of people that I knew, and I'm sure I'm, I'm including myself, I'm sure, but not in any direct way. But in every way except the fact that I'm not one of the characters, that's exactly what we were doing in 1982. And that's exactly how we were talking, and that's exactly the kind of trouble we were getting in and hopefully getting out of. When This Is Our Youth and Margaret, I write about affluent 
urban youth. I grew up in the Upper West Side. We described ourselves as upper middle class. We very much didn't want to be thought of as rich compared to the rest of the world. Of course, 99% of the world were very wealthy compared to 95% of the rest of the country were very wealthy. But my parents are not, are not business magnates. They're psychiatrists. So I grew up in you know, comparatively comfortable circumstances like, like a lot of Americans and comparatively comfortable circumstances like a lot of New Yorkers or a lot of Manhattanites. Some critics in London, when they saw this, they used to say, why should we care about these spoiled brats? And I sort of wanted to point out that one of the spoiled brats had his sister murdered when he was 10 years old, that his mother is mentally unstable, and that his father beats him up physically and throws him out of the house frequently, that he's nearly addicted to drugs. I just, if you, you sort of feel like there's an income. I, I, I occasionally want to ask at what income level or uh, do people stop being spoiled and, and, and overprivileged? Like, like Lisa and Margaret is often described as overprivileged. And isn't there just privileged? I mean, I don't know that she's overprivileged. I mean, I'm privileged. I'm privileged to be alive and healthy and not starving to death and not living in a country which is at war and where my village is being burned down and my children massacred in front of me. I mean, we all are. So, I mean, those of us who don't have to live like that. Overprivileged? I don't know. I, I feel like I grew up being taught not to feel good about having been born into relatively comfortable circumstances. And then at some point when I was in my 20s or 30s, I thought, gee, you know, there's so many people who would be so happy if they had a nice, safe house in a relatively safe neighborhood in the world. And it's sort of obnoxious. It, it, there's something obnoxious and hypocritical not to be appreciative of that and to say, oh, I feel bad that I'm not in worse circumstances. I have no Irish guilt. I like to make a distinction between Jewish guilt and Irish shame. <laughs> my friend Matthew Broderick's mother, Patsy Broderick, who was one of my best friends and was the smartest person I ever met, said that guilt is a very cheap emotion. And I don't know if she was quoting someone or if she made it up. She said, you know, you do something, you feel bad about it, then you go ahead and get over it and you go ahead and do it again. And it doesn't really cost you anything. <laughs> and I think shame is a little more of a, a, a half-life than guilt. But this is a these are just crass generalizations. I don't know if they have any validity whatsoever. And I definitely consider myself, I mean, half Irish, half Jewish. I'll, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose either half. I got involved in Gangs of New York because one of the great fortunes of my life is having gotten to know Martin Scorsese and having him take an interest in me when I was younger and, and help me out and be sort of an avuncular figure to me. And, uh, through a very circuitous route, but um, I had written a script for him which not, never gotten produced, and he had almost optioned my first film script that I wrote to sell for money, analyze this, and we discussed doing this or that together over the years, and then I, try, I heard about Gangs of New York and I, I, wanted to, I tried out for the job, but he had already given it to someone else, and Jay Cox had, and he had written the script together, and they were looking for another writer, and they ended up hiring Steve Zalian, and then I forgot about it. And then a few years later, I had just gotten married and got a call from my agent saying that they were about to start shooting gangs of New York in Chinichita outside of Rome, and they needed the script rewritten. But they, they were shooting in two weeks, and they needed me to start right away. And was, would I consider flying to Italy and being put up in a really fancy hotel and working for Martin Scorsese with Daniel Day-Lewis and Leonardo DiCaprio and Cameron Diaz. And, and uh, <clears throat> I said, yes, sure, I would be very interested. And uh, he, Marty thought that he would, Marty has, has been very grateful to me ever since because I allowed him to, to think that he was disrupting my honeymoon. The fact is we rented a place in Long Island to get married in and then stay there for the summer. That was going to be our honeymoon. And we had been there for a month and a half. So it was, this was like mid-August, so we did plenty of honeymooning. So I, but he felt so bad about taking me away from my honeymoon that uh, I used it as a negotiating wedge, uh, both psychologically and, and with Miramax to, to get them to pay me a decent wage because Miramax didn't like to pay full scale in those days. My agent was like, they won't pay you anything, but they'll treat you great. And I, I knew, 
I, I knew if the director wanted to hire me, that that meant I would be hired. So I, I said, well, tell Miramax that I'm happy to help out for free if they don't want to pay me, but I'm not going to rewrite the script. I w I'd like to get paid the regular, my regular fee, and I'd like them to put me in a nice hotel. Any t and any time they didn't do that, I would complain to Marty, and he'd call, up, call him up and be like, he's writing the movie, he's writing the fucking movie. Let him, let him, maybe he maybe should have a room to write in. So anyway, that was one of the great experiences of my life. It was wonderful. I think Gangs of New York is, is, is more of a New York story than it's a particular Irish story. I think it's, it could have been about any group of immigrants. It happened to be about the Irish immigrants chiefly. If it had taken place 20 years later, it would have been about Italian immigrants. Um, 20 years after that, I mean, another group. I think Marty wanted to make a movie about the cauldron that the city came out of. Is this it, priest? The Pope's new army? When I approach writing dialogue, I just try to write, I just try as best I can to imitate the way people really talk. Um, every person speaks, has their own syntax and way of speaking. Um, James Joyce is the great master of this. My father pointed out to me when I was 13, said he's really the only writer who, whose characters really sound different from one another completely. And it's really true, if you read his stories and his novels, the distinction in the different voices is astonishing. It's way head and shoulders above anybody else. We all tend to fall into our own rhythm, no matter how hard we try to make the characters speak distinctively. But my approach to dialogue is to have people say what I think they would say. I think I have a good ear for dialogue, just naturally. And I, I happen to like overlapping dialogue. Uh, I, I just like, it just sounds cool to me. Um, but, uh, and it's fun to write and it's fun to see acted. Try not to focus on that aspect of it too much right off the bat. Why not? Well. I think you should. Well. I mean, maybe it was better when you came in here and they screamed at you for having sex with your married boss. For the most part, I, I just try to uh, write what I hear, and, uh, and I do consciously try to go through it and make sure the characters all have their own way of speaking. Um, I just think that's more lifelike. I've never been interested in didactic writing. I don't think, I don't. I've never wanted to write a play to prove a point or to make a statement. In fact, I think it's very, very difficult to write a successful, uh, a successful, I mean creatively successful play or film whose main aim is to persuade people to think, to, to have a certain opinion. Movies and plays are about human beings. Now, there's all kinds of movies and plays, so they don't have to be like the kind that I like to write, but the kind that I like to write and the ones that I like to see are more they're more descriptive of th something that you you haven't seen before, or they're they're more. They point out things in life that you haven't noticed yourself, that the writer has noticed, or that the director has noticed, or that you've noticed but no one else has described in a work of art before. Um, so you have that sense of being of seeing something familiar that you'd never quite. Oh, I know that situation, or that speaks to me, or something that you know nothing about that speaks to you, which is even more interesting. I, I think that you're trying to recreate life in some way. And one, one thing about life is that it's coming, there's so much of it, it's hard to get a handle on. And I mean, that's part of, that's one thing that interests me. Everyone sees the world from their own point of view, naturally, because it's the only point of view they've got. And the writers that I like, I think, point out patterns that I myself have not noticed, or connections that I haven't noticed, or paint uh, pictures of worlds that I don't know. And if they paint them truthfully, then, some, then I do know something about them, which, which is almost impossible. How would I know? If you read Proust, how in the world would I know anything about what it was like to be mixing with the French aristocracy in the late 19th century and early 20th century? Well, the fact is I do know something about that because I've read Proust, who is wonderful. And how would I know anything about like life in Dublin in 1904 if I didn't... If, but you read Dubliners and you do know something about it. And it's like, it's, just, it's one of the great things that human beings can do is, is describe the world accurately enough for someone who 
doesn't know that world to have a feeling about it and an understanding of it. So that's what I try to do. I'm not saying I, I'm not saying I'm as good as those guys, but I try. <laughs> so he points at Dawn and he says, "You want me to tell you what I see out there, Jeff? Sure, Bill. I see a little girl wearing a police uniform. Okay, I see a little girl from the neighborhood or some moron told her she could be a cop. She's not a cop right now." But if somebody takes a shot at her or somebody's life depends on her, they're not going to know she's not a cop. They're going to think she knows what she's doing. She walks around the corner where somebody's trying to rob somebody or rape somebody or kill somebody. They're not going to know she's a little girl in a cop suit. They're going to see a badge and a uniform and a gun, and they're going to blow a hole through her fucking head. Somebody runs up to her and asks her to help him. She's not going to help him. She's going to look around and say, where's Bill? Where's Bill? That's me. I'm Bill. Now, I could tell that girl likes me. It's only natural. I'm a partner, I'm a big, strong father figure, whatever. I've got a lot of experience, got a lot of confidence. I know what I'm fucking doing. That's attractive to a woman. It's attractive to anybody. So she's attracted to me. That's okay. She's human. I'm human. Maybe part of what I'm doing, part of building her confidence, is making her feel like I'm interested in her too. Maybe that makes her feel impressive. Makes her feel cocky. Makes her feel like she's got something on the ball. Makes her feel like she's really a cop. 